on this approach to consciousness. Well, uh, the first time I left Brazil was in 1996 when I went to the MIT for postdoctoral period of two years. And when I arrived there, my supervisor, Dr. Steve Chorover, he told me, he looked at my project and told me, well, you want to understand how the brain works, but it's not possible. <laughs> he said that uh, the attempts to understand how the brain works, uh, they end with metaphors and analogies. And I was not able to reply, but I have been trying to make analogies that have good support in empirical experimental research. Maybe someday we'll have a, a good explanation of consciousness, but the possible step now is that to make a good analogy and then relate with experimental findings and have progress. Uh, I will present to you the state of art of my metaphor, uh, beginning with the theory advanced by Velmas from Goldsmiths. If and anyone's, uh, sorry, if anyone's not aware, Max is a uh, emeritus professor in our department, but he's um, he's not based in London anymore, so he only comes around Gold's just like once a year. <laughs> right. Sorry, just wanted to clarify. And uh, I use it uh, as an example, now the virtual reality roller coaster that I had my own experience, and there are many interesting videos in the uh, YouTube, uh, in shopping centers, the people have this experience and the relatives and friends they make movies and so we have a material inter interesting material that is not for formal but we also have uh, some uh, scientific studies of what happens in the brain during the, the experience the, the dizziness that happens and uh, two, two questions that I raise now, why, uh, if there is no real gravitational effect on the, on the body, né, why do people feel the dizziness? And why we, cannot, we are not able to, to uh, avoid the, the, the dizziness and the behavioral, behavioral exposure? Now we, it's like uh, something that people feel ashamed because they scream and so, uh, uh, I will show two uh, short uh, examples. Here we have two girls. Well, the 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 train is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the chair is still some some cases the the, the chair also moves the effect is uh, but if the chair is moving there are potential issues about like inertia yeah and yeah. so on right so Strange that she she tries to touch the mask. <laughs> uh, the, 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 you obviously can't do that. Cause <laughs> the only thing that we can do is to close the eyes. But we don't want to close the eyes because we are paying for the the, the sessions. <laughs> so now it's uh, with adults. The reaction of children is more strong, stronger. I will jump to the part where the...
so <laughs> there's more of the same but uh, I will not uh, <laughs> spend your time <laughs> so you come back to the presentation Could, um, maybe, I don't know if you're going to address this, but can you maybe talk about how common that is? Like, presumably there's massive individual differences in this. There are, uh, the main difference are between young and people and adults, because the adults have more capacity to control. There is one, uh, one of the experiments, they compared, uh, the, they gave a, a stimulation to the those lateral prefrontal cortex of and the adults responded better to the uh, there was more inhibition of the of this kind of behavior what types what type of simulations are like, like tdcs well, or i something think it or? was yes yes the, okay. i can check but uh, it it was uh, transcranial uh, because, because there's because there's so much variability like the first thing because my mind is like embodiment or something like that right um, and there's massive variability embodiment in the during VR, right? Because some people do not feel like they're in the VR at all, right? The individual difference. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm just wondering, if, but maybe I'll let you. I'll, I just want, I'm just interested in the individual differences size. Yes, I, I, I don't know of a population study. This, this, this I studied with few subjects, but the one of the studies uh, compared uh, cases. Uh, of virtual reality uh, stimulation and uh, real physical stimulation with gravitational force, etc., and the the impact on the brain is the same for the. But of course, there must be an individual difference that for the purpose of, of this discussion here. I think the individual difference are not so important. Because the, the the samples we find in YouTube are, are because uh, they publish in YouTube the most exotic, uh, strange, uh, ridiculous cases that people sure sure make yeah, it, yeah those are probably not representative yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, probably some people do, uh, can can control I, uh, yeah but f in my case I was not able to control I. Said some things I would not like to say, and looked at it some. Well, so okay, so uh, the framework is based on neuroscience, and uh, the three neurosciences that appeared in the 90s they uh, address different brain mechanisms, different brain uh, structures and functions. So uh, the the understanding of consciousness probably requires the understanding of how cognition affects feeling and action systems, that, uh, the motor systems, the systems that control action, and how they interact. Uh, it's not uh, possible to to approach consciousness only because it's possible, but not. Uh, complete approach if we address only one of these aspects. So, in terms of brain physiology, uh, we have the, the cognitive neuroscience, including computational neuroscience, addressing uh, the spike trains, uh, action potentials, ex the sequences in time, both in single neurons and in neural assemblies, where we find the phenomenon of synchronization. And, and the synaptic connections between the neurons with the relative weights. So we assume that the information is stored in the connect, uh, synaptic connections. And so we have a, a subsystem of the brain that is uh, in charge of cognitive processes involving attention, learning, planning, uh, moral judgment, etc., etc. Right. Uh, effective neuroscience, beginning with Punk Sips, uh, work with the same name, effective neuroscience, uh, focus on different processes in the brain, the neuromodulators, the neuropeptides inducing uh, 
excitatory inhibitory states in the tissue. It's, so it's a tissue approach. It's not a approach based on pulse, pulses, discrete pulses, like okay. action potential, right? And uh, so we have uh, in the living tissue some uh, kinds of excitation that correspond to emotional affective states. We have both in, in the brain. The, so we have uh, pulses and we have wave-like process in the tissue, both together, work together. And actual neuroscience focuses mostly on the motor systems, the connections uh, of the pyramidal neurons of the motor cortex with the uh, muscles uh, and the feedback from action to perception, that so-called corollary discharge that uh, also uh, allows us to to predict the the result of an action. The Italian group is very good at this. Galeas, it. Uh, so we have these three neurosciences and uh, how they uh, they contribute to consciousness. So the project theory of consciousness is one of the candidates to explain the integration of mental functions. Uh, in my view, it's not uh, the original version of uh, Max Wellness, but in my view, the, affect the affective dimension is uh, necessary for experience. For instance, a robot can register uh, visual images, the, it can um, uh, process the information using uh, probabilistic calculation, deep learning, etc. The robot can move in their environment and he can make a lot of things, but it is not able to feel. It doesn't have the affective components. Then we, we consider the robot as not conscious. How, how broadly are you using the term affective here? Yeah, yeah this is uh, an <laughs> important because, issue. Because, because, I, because I can come with some counter instances yeah, depending, depending on yes, how uh, broad you want to go. Uh, affective, I will explain better in, a, in our next slide what the, the, the importance of the affective component. But it's in the broadest sense, everything we use the verb to feel, right? Uh, in a first approach, say, I feel the taste of the nut. So, uh, uh, this is uh, a feeling. I feel the taste. I feel the smell. Uh, unfortunately, we don't say I feel the color, but it's the same type of situation that uh, all quailia are a kind of feeling. But this is very complicated. I, 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 I hope to, to uh, advance a bit during the talk. And it's good to remember that Damasio uh, uses the term feeling for this uh, all types of conscious experience of both sens sensation and emotion. So affect is not limited to emotion. This is, uh, emotion is a type of feeling or affect. Affect and feeling are here uh, uh, mixed. Well, uh, a very simple picture of the of the proposal. So we have the three systems in the brain. We have information reaching the central nervous system. No, nothing more than information. We, uh, you, as you, you know very well, when uh, I eat a nut, the molecules of the nut don't reach the central nervous system. They uh, they uh, bind to the receptors, uh, and then there is a spike train from the receptors to the central nervous system. So what the central nervous system receives is information encoded in the frequency and phase of the uh, spike train, right? And this uh, information reaches the, percep the perceptual system is included here, okay? Uh, we form a knowledge, a basically a representation of the qualities, right? This representation is uh, available to the motor system, so we can have a closed loop here, and then this uh, this behavior is is not considered to be conscious, consciously uh, voluntary, conscious behavior. But we have also this system of feeling that interacts 
the, the, this system is not in direct connection with the information, income information, neither with the control of behavior. It's uh, inner layer, right? But it's uh, interacting in and modulating both. So when we have the participation of feeling, we have a conscious uh, process. What's the difference between feeling and knowing here? Because the way you described feeling a moment ago, <coughs> you described it in a very broad sense that could even be equated, equated with awareness. So what's no, no, I want to make so a sharp distinction because no is information processing, for instance. Uh, this but feel, feeling is information processing too, though. No, feeling is more. Feeling is a, a wave of energy that crosses the, the brain, the body. So feeling is a, some, uh, a, is a force, is a, a, an experience that is different from knowing. But if we consciously know something, there must be a, a feeling driving. Uh, for instance, uh, in the concept, the classical concept of knowledge that Plato criticized, but people associate with Plato, we say that knowledge is uh, knowledge is uh, true belief, uh, justified true belief, justified yeah, true yeah. belief. So the belief would be a feeling that supports that knowledge, but this is in the already an interaction between. Uh, so the, the knowledge would require a belief that is generated here and supporting that. So knowledge is not only having information or using the information. You need also to believe in the information. So uh, in this view, the, the feeling is, uh, is necessary for conscious processing, for consciousness. So, uh, but this is the, the, the what I'm trying to, <laughs> to uh, defend here, right? But of course, uh, you, 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 you. And one other little quick thing: uh, Do you allow for the arrow to go the other direction as well between physical qualities and knowing, or no? No, what goes the other direction is the behavior, right? Okay. So uh, we receive, uh, so for instance. Um, yeah. So if you look at the modern theories of emotion, like uh, appraisal theories, and you can look at Phoebe Ellsworth's work. She would argue that actually in order to understand affect or emotion in those terms, and that's just a theory of emotion, not consciousness more broadly, she talks about how in order to understand an emotional episode, you need to take into account all of the qualities of both the organism, but also of the environment as well, because the correlation between what you're experiencing and the uh, and, and a stimulus isn't as Paul Ekman would have predicted, just a sort of linear one. And I think the phrase she used that the, you need the water to both grow the plant, but it is also part of the plant as well. Yeah, so uh, Lisa Barrett uh, is a, uh, uh, she's a sort of extreme yeah. constructionist sort of building and James Russell yeah. stuff, but she's her argument is very But uh, it's not contradictory because the only ways of uh, the, the social uh, social mm -hmm. patterns of relation and affordance, etc., to reach the central nervous system is by, by means of information. Yeah, right. so, so, so someone, the circle could be bigger in a way. The, the circle around the three knowing, feeling, and acting could. Um, include the physical qualities as well to define the phenomenon. Inside the brain. No, I'm talking okay. about the okay. stimulus. Here is the stimulus. For instance, you see a person kill another person. Say, this is the stimulus. What will reach your brain is the information. Okay. Right? Uh, but of course, this information it has a social, cultural uh, uh, origin, too. It's not just. Uh, uh, sorry, here I, I this physically maybe should be removed. So we have patterns that not only physical qualities, uh, because physical qualities anything uh, uh, is more in the case of vision, for instance. You receive uh, photons; uh, they re reach the retinas. Uh, but uh, in the generation of the stimulus, we can have. Uh, what the Gibsonian scale affords that is the the pattern that is constructed in, in the interaction between many things, including social context of things. So, uh, okay, I will, I will remove this uh, physical quality. I will say patterns. That, right. So, antecedent events, I guess, is better. Hmm? Antecedent events. 
antecedent events. Antecedent. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, there is a evolutionary connection between feelings and the, the psychological drive and, and patterns of behavior. Maybe the first to, to discuss this was James Mark Baldwin, that paper in 1896 about consciousness and, and evolution. He already related uh, consciousness with attribution of valence to the stimul stimuli. So the adaptive value of consciousness is that we uh, distinguish what is good and what is bad, what is causes pain, what causes pleasure, and then we look more for what causes pleasure and we avoid what causes pain. So this would be the adaptive function of consciousness, that, according to James Baldwin. And what is the guide for the, this valence is how, how it feels, right? It feels good, feels bad. So feeling is a guide for conscious behavior. <laughs> I, here I, I, I make a quote of your, your colleague. Uh, it was a, a paper on the wall. I, I just used it. <laughs> 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 Do you know the papers? There's also a few papers out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're talking about like um, higher order theories of consciousness, not like consciousness of like a, where, where the baseline of consciousness is. So, like with feeling as a force mechanism, you're also thinking about. Um, Time is not necessarily linear, so feelings about future situations and future about it in the present situations um, can have equal force about the agency on a, a, a person's actions, but they might have um, feel, uh, like feelings doesn't have an initial. It, it might it might not have um, like. Any sort of any sort of control over that agency, whether it's a future action or an immediate action, they might be uh, uh, feeling feelings that are ma just as malleable as as agency is. Well, I don't know. Uh, I, w the dynamics of feeling is slower than the dynamics of cognition. Right? So the the neuron fires may f can fire each three milliseconds in the neuron. Files. But the feelings take one, two, three seconds to. So there is a uh, dilated dynamics. So, uh, but I'm not, I, 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 I cannot speak about uh, time reversal based on feelings. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's a question of, of memories as being retrieved by the feeling. Hey, I don't know if <laughs> your question is about this. It's kind of to explain. Um, and, uh, okay, so someone has a feeling of control over their actions, but you're saying feeling so also um, what drives agency. Right. Um, so which comes first, agency or feeling? Because oh. because you like you it, uh, in, 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 the, one in a brain based uh, approach it must be the, the feeling because uh, but you know, the sense of agency a feeling? Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah. Isn't sense of agency a feeling then? It is a feeling. What? Agency. Sense of agency. 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 Like what's on oh, yes, uh, the the your colleague uh, defined the agency defined as the feeling of control. Yeah, so James mentioned it's got to be true, right? So, um, but yeah, so it's a feeling, right? So when you say like the, there's a feeling that precedes that, like what are you what are you saying exactly? A um, feeling that precedes the feeling of agency. Yeah, yeah what was like, I thinking? Yeah. Oh, there is always a feeling. So uh, you uh, you can uh, move from one feeling to the other, or from a hegemonic feeling to the other, you can have peripheral feelings, so the, uh, I have an idea that uh, when you want to change your behavior, you need to change your feeling, because the feeling drives the behavior. So this is the problem with uh, uh, treatment, uh, cognitive behavioral treatment for anxiety, for instance, that 
uh, the person uh, it's not uh, change the cognition or change the behavior is not uh, sustainable you, you need the but, person but, needs some, but sometimes behavior drives feelings we, yeah. we, we perform a lot of actions and then we retrospectively justify them in various ways and that generates feelings like you'll make a political decision You'll, you'll choose between two candidates and then you justify it after the fact. Feeling well, that's in this is not research showing that. This is not the best description because the brain controls the, the, the movements of the body, but the movements of the body don't control the brain, right? So, what happens is that uh, when you change your behavior, in fact, you are changing your feeling too because you are uh, as, uh, changing the drive that generates the behavior, right? But uh, uh, we can say that uh, the person changed the behavior and then changed the feeling. This is William James' famous theory of emotion. Uh, that uh, first I, uh, I cry and then I feel sad. <laughs> But I think that there are good criticisms against this approach because uh, there is no causal connection of, uh, of the, of the cry between the how to say, the drop of water, the expression, the expression the of, of the emotion with the mechanisms of emotion in the central nervous system, right? So, But there are examples of behavior where there's no, um, to borrow Chris's phrase, an antecedent conscious experience, and the conscious experience yes, yes, falls yes. afterwards. Good examples of um, change blindness, choice blindness, these types of effects. Yes, yes. Be, be, this is because we have also not conscious or unconscious processing all the time. Uh, but this. But the feeling in these, in these cases, it looks like the feeling. As, no, as no, you're the describing it doesn't necessarily perceive the behavior. That's all. Yes, uh, the emotion may be unconscious, but the feeling, by definition, here is always conscious. So, uh, if we have uh, an emotion, an unconscious, an unconscious emotion driving the behavior, it's perfectly possible. But in this case, uh, does not conflict with what I'm proposing that uh, the the. Uh, The, there is always a, a feeling that will uh, mediate the unconscious drive to consciousness in the case of conscious action, because if not, the, the action is not conscious. So I can have, a, if the unconscious emotions drive my behavior, this is not conscious behavior. Okay, so that, so that would be your way out of it. You would just say in those types of situations, if the behavior precedes the feeling, then the behavior itself is unconscious. Yeah. Is that? Yes, Fine. yes, this is the, the, the argument. <laughs> I don't know if... Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure yeah, if I yeah, believe yeah, that, but yeah. at least it's, it's parsimonious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So here is uh, the original theory by Marx. So we have uh, an event here, the cat. The light rays carry the information reach the retina, then we have now all the nerve, uh, the optic nerve sent to the town, sent to, to primary visual cortex, and then forming a representation of where, what, where, and then this uh, generates a conscious state, and then this, uh, the content of, this conscious content is projected to where the cat is, because we see the cat there, we don't see the cat inside our brains. So this is very simplified, but I think it's the most uh, interesting uh, issue that was raised uh, about consciousness, because the consciousness is projected in the geometrical sense. We uh, like two points project a line. So we have something happening in the brain, but it's projected to the outside. We don't see the cat in the brain, right? We see the cat outside. And uh, this uh, proposal of, of Marx uh, is uh, paradoxical because we have the, the pattern at, at the same time inside the brain and outside the brain. <coughs> so uh, most philosophers don't accept, they say, oh, 
the cat is there outside, so we have the externalist view. The content is there outside the brain, and then we have we have also the internalist. They say no, the content, the cat is only the rep uh, a representation in the brain. But in, in Marx's approach, the, it's internalist and externalist. There is an internal representation, and there is a a, a external pattern that and there is a correspondence between them. And I make this uh, improvement or destroying the Max theories, uh, 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 inserting feeling as the driving f force for the projection for the action. Well, I will what, type of, what is this type of account? So I'm only kind of superficially aware of this account. It's really a I would argue this isn't really a theory of consciousness. I would argue this is a theory of, um, of perception because I can have conscious mentation right now that has no external referent. And so this notion of projection is no longer necessary in any way. But, uh, I, I can have a conscious experience you know, of an image of my mother right now and there's no projective element. So you kind of do away with all these things, but then you're still left with the ultimate question that we're all interested in is that there's this black box, right, that does all this stuff in our brain. But right? uh, the, the Belmont theory is about perception, it's not about thinking, right? But in my development that now, uh, it's, it becomes a theory about the whole, of the structure of consciousness, right? So we have here, this is the phenomenal domain, we have a self and a world, a sense of self, a sense of world, it's not the world here, but the, the sense of world, we have a, a now and a here, right? And uh, the four uh, brain functions co contribute, also memory and prediction, contribute to the uh, conscious domain. Feeling is the most important because the feeling defines the self, the self is the one who feels. And the now, while the feeling lasts. So the, the duration of the feeling it uh, is related to the sense of self. So to this, the this is like an activist's take on um, cognition, embodied activist. Not an activist, it's an uh, hedonist, uh, like a, a feeling, a, a affective view, as the co because we have it. Uh, Perception is contributing for the sense of the world, for the things we see yeah, here. Like, and activism is like the, is the idea that, that you, have, you both have an internal and an external projection of the world and it's embodied. And so your feelings come from, come from that. Yes, that, it's, that, it's that an embodied view. It's an embodied view, embodied, embedded view. But not in the sense that the schemes for action, they are the content. Not. The, uh, because the, the action control operates more on the on the world. So when we think without uh, any perceptual content, we are we need uh, the self to think. So we need the sense of self. How do we generate do, do we have a sense of self? It's because we feel. It so you need to have a sense of self in order to have a thought? Yes. Okay. I I would I would I, I would I would be a little bit nervous about that. Because the computer... Because uh, there, there are psychiatric conditions which are characterized by pronounced distortions and quote-unquote the sense of self, in which these individuals appear to be able to have relatively normal perceptual states, mental representations, and so on. So now, mind you, a whole host of kind of other states and other psychological functions may be impaired by the disruption of the self. It might affect emotion and a whole host of other things. But these individuals are capable of basic kind of mental representations. Well, but if the sense of self is so core, then a disruption of the sense of self should have these cascading effects on all the kind of corresponding psychological functions, right? Yeah, we can discuss if this the schizophrenic that has uh, this... Uh, this yeah, so, I mean, so, schi so, schi so schizophrenia, um, depersonalization disorder... I'm pretty sure that they are conscious and that they uh, they they they, uh, they don't have the sense of self completely uh, destroyed. It's a, uh, sure, it's uh, sure it's not completely destroyed, and that's obviously a very difficult experiment to do to identify an individual where they have no sense of self, right? But 
if the sense of self plays a causal role in these other functions and is core, a disruption of the sense of self is necessary and necessarily follows that's going to have these cascading effects on these other psychological functions, but that does not appear to be the case necessarily in these conditions. Well, what is essential is uh, baby being able of feeling because this computer processes information, makes calculation, makes a lot of things, but it doesn't have uh, capacity of feeling. So it doesn't have a sense of self. It doesn't have a sense of now and here. It doesn't have a sense of the world. It's, isn't right? it? Uh, is not false equivalence between the, the computer's perception of, of information, if you like, or processing information in our own? It's doing it in a different way, fundamentally. It's built differently, if you like. Mm -hmm. Not so different because you take a, a camera. The camera re receives photos. They form an image that uh, is based on uh, discrete signals, like zero and one. And we have uh, the formation of representations by means of quasi discrete signals, like uh, neuron is fine, not fine, in the population. So I think it's not so different. So, uh, but that's only like a small fragment of the kind of. Uh, of the psychological apparatus, right? Like you yeah, might say, the camera is a very elementary model of maybe how visual stimuli are processed by the retina and sent to some region of the brain. But at that point, the analogy breaks down completely. Yeah. Right? yeah well, what what more you have? What we have the this tissue waves of energy that are controlled by neuro uh, modulators and uh, uh, the so-called chemical transmission, uh, and then uh, we have. Other, you have other, but uh, I'm just claiming that it is the other uh, features of, of the other aspects of the brain that are responsible for for consciousness. But like, wouldn't the self? Wouldn't you argue that the self could come from our actual actions in the world? So, the, the capacity to, to it cannot act, come act in. Actions in the world gives us the self confirmation that we are. The action in the world is important, but it's not sufficient because we have, for instance, that robot named Cog by Rodney Brooks. He was uh, treated as a human person, he had a father, a mother, and he was not able to uh, to, to, con to yeah, have any signal of, to develop any signal of consciousness. Action is like it is, it's not voluntary. Though. It's like with a ro with a robot, it's like there's there's like there's, there's functions that it performs on at a specific time given a certain input, whereas we're immediately born into a world where all our sensory systems are activated and acting within that world, and it's that experience with the, within the interaction of the world that gives us the sense of self. Yeah, we aren't designed, we develop. Yeah, well, this is what uh, I try to show here, because uh, we now we are acting or receiving information, this circuit may work without the feeling, so we have unconscious uh, processes. When we have the involvement of feeling in this interaction, we have conscious. So this is how I see it. Right. So I remember that in the Matthew view that you cited, the feeling is strictly connected with the self because feeling is uh, strictly linked with the homeostasis. So, uh, and, and the homeostasis required a minimal notion of, of self, it required a minimal self, you know, so yes. differentiation feeling is... Um, I agree, thank you, for, uh, and this the view that James Mark Baldwin made in the 19th century, I think, the Damasio probably doesn't know, but uh, uh, Baldwin was a Darwinian psychologist that, uh, very important in Canada, he founded University there, and but he's not remembered today. Well, let me go on because <laughs> <laughs> I think I a, in the interest of time, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, my approach uh, is different from the Nobel Nobelist Kahneman because he uh, his theory of system one system two maybe you probably yeah. know he uh, thinks that feelings are uh, unconscious drives the, the 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 system one is not conscious but i i distinguish between uh the conscious drive uh, that feeling of feeling and the, the uh, there are also unconscious factors that may influence the action but in this case the action is not conscious <laughs> it's like a tautology, but right. uh, so.
So now we can uh, move to the second part of the talk, that is the uh, analysis of the phenomenon of dizziness. So I I retrieved eight, not nine papers uh, this month in PubMed, and I identified five categories of results. This is not an uh, exhaustive analysis, of course, this is a preliminary view. Uh, the first important uh, result is that uh, different uh, researchers found that uh, the brain uh, activation is the same both in the virtual reality roller coaster and in situations where there is a, a, a physical stimulation by gravity or inertial. Então, uh, okay, what they call cyber sickness and classical motion sickness are quite similar, the, the, the changes in the brain. So this is very important because we, uh, we are uh, talking about uh, an effect that comes from conscious processing, not by a direct physical stimulation. <coughs> uh, the system responsible for the sensing of this gravitational initial change is the <coughs> vestibular system that's coupled to the auditory system. Again. And it also can be activated by visual and auditory stimulation. It's not uh, exclusive. The, the, there is no exclusive is, uh, stimulation by the uh, changes in, in body movement, vertical, downward, vertical movement. So this is what uh, explains the, the dizziness that people have during the virtual reality roller coasters because they are exposed only to visual and auditory stim stimulation in the case where the chair is not moving, it's not uh, tilting. They are they, it's just visual and auditory stimulation but they have the feeling of dizziness and they have the uh, related behaviors uh, as if né, like as if they had they were in a real roller coaster. Uh, so, uh, there is a, a mechanism that uh, causes somatic and behavioral effects. And how do they, they measure this? They measure uh, change in blood flow. So, we talk about change in blood flow, we are talking about the tissue exc excitation that requires more arterial blood, as you, you know from fMRI, etc. The areas of the brain that are more activated, they need more arterial blood. So, uh, the impact on the brain is mediated by this metabolic change that it's not uh, necessarily a cognitive phenomenon, it's a phenomenon related to emotion, feeling. Right? <coughs> Of course, it must impact the, 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 the spike trains, uh, all the cognitive process. So. Interesting that uh, they, some authors uh, suggested uh, that the dizziness is related to a, a feeling, the feeling of presence. Define that. The feeling of being there <laughs> sounds like Damatio's book, the, the feeling of what happened. Uh, a sense of being physically situated within a spatial environment protected by a medium. Uh, in this case, uh, electronic medium. Uh, med. The feeling present in a virtual environment to act as if this environment is real. So we have two possibilities. One is that the, the feeling of presence is disrupted 
and then it's felt as a, it generates a state of dizziness and then the state uh, the physiological neurophysiological changes and they uh, cause the behavior that we see in the video right, right. the thing could happen in like dreams which aren't directly triggered by visual stimuli in this case you've got a visual stimuli that, that like, um, that, that generates the, these images externally, but in dreams you can still go through and that, have the experience of presence um, yes, within yeah. them and have the same things of fear, feeling fear, whatever. But like, what instigates that is is not it's, it's not yeah, no, so this is a, a a a note that you made that reinforces the what I, my message. So we can have a. A, a, a change in feeling that has it, it does not depend on uh, on external stimulation uh, in this case of the virtual reality we have a, a physical stimulation but a physical stimulation that will generate a conscious experience and, and then the conscious experience will cause the the, the movement, the behavior, the changes in the endocrine system, the skin conductance that we was measured to change in cerebral blood flow. No, the, the, cere the change in cerebral blood, blood flow is, is, is the same event of the, of the change in feeling because the, uh, it, it's a, a complex process. So uh, I, uh, we, we can have different interpretations, right? But uh, in, in the dream, we don't have the external stimulation, we, we, and we don't have the call it reafferent sig uh, signal. We, do, uh, we don't have the possibility of acting on the environment and seeing what happens, and then perceiving the effect of, the, of our action in the, in the environment. We so we internally generate those environments ourselves. Purely internally generate. So it will involve an interplay of our feelings and our and uh, and our representations during the dream. We have. And it, the, the representations may trigger a feeling, the feeling that is triggered may uh, influence the next representation. We have a, a dynamic interplay in the central nervous system, and then we may cause a behavior, say, suddenly we, we wake up. Also, or some people, uh, sonamb uh, sonambulism, they go out of the bed. Um, another finding is that the uh, what I mentioned before they use it uh, not uh, net <coughs> but uh, direct current that's when they direct current during the dizziness and they could uh, they could uh, inhibit uh, and not, but not in children, because children uh, don't have the, the, the prefrontal cortex fully developed. Right. Okay, so I will go to the conclusion, concluding remarks. So, the, the re reaction to the virtual reality roller coaster is similar to the, the to what happens during vertical and downward movements. The, the input, uh, the stimulation of this, of the gravi gravitational inertial detectors of the vestibular system is not necessary. Uh, and the somatic change in skin conductance uh, and behavioral effects people shot and move the, the bond. Uh, and they, uh, in my experience, I was not able to suppress by means of cognitive control. I thought, I know I will not shout, but I shout. Suggest that the conscious experience is guided by the effective drive. This is what I intend to, to argue, <laughs> to claim. <laughs> right, that the, the dizziness is a perturbation of, uh, in the feeling yeah. and changes the effective drive. 
um, so the dizziness would be a, a perturbation of the feeling of prelates. We have this type of homeostatic uh, uh, balance between the self and the world, and so we the self has a place in the world, but when the virtual roller coasters moves downward, it seems that the, the, the subject will be destroyed, the, the, the presence will disappear, right? Yeah. Isn't it less about the, the sense of self being potentially destroyed, it's more about the sense of being present in that environment? Yeah. That's what they're talking about. I don't think it's <coughs> a threat to the self, no? Oh, I see. No? I think that's how they're, I think they're using the term presence maybe in a, in a way that's different than you are. Yes, the, the presence... Just the feeling that you're present seems, in the VR environment. I think they're using it in a fairly everyday sense of how we use the word presence. Yeah, yeah but the presence uh, is at risk of, be, of being annihilated, uh, not the self, I agree with you. But because the, the presence is the presence of the self. <laughs> it's, a bit tricky, but but uh, it's, different, uh, uh, it's different. And the final, uh, uh, it's about the projective theory in, in, in the philosophy of mind that this idea of uh, we have a purely internal representation that is the content of consciousness and other. Authors claim that the content is external object, and so in this case, the there is a affordance pattern that uh, maybe we, we can call a negative affordance because the the presence seems to be the, there is a pattern that seems to suppress the presence of the of the subject. Uh, so uh, the affordance pattern is. Uh, in the relation with the environment, in this case a virtual environment, it's not... But, and there is also a, a mental process internal to the central nervous system that is uh, driving the, the, the behavior, the somatic response. And then I speculate here at the end that uh, this may be the, the mechanism uh, in anxiety because, uh, for instance, uh, I was doing a, a mathematical test and I was, it was very difficult, I was not able to, to solve and then uh, I felt as if I was being um, uh, blocked in my studies. Uh, I was not able to, to pass. So I, I felt uh, pain, right? So this, uh, uh, when you have a, a, a situation where there is the, uh, the, the affordance is uh, negative, so it seems that we will, we, we, the presence is, uh, the continuity of the presence will be uh, not possible. So this is the, my speculation at the end, and I thank you all very much for your attention, and if, if you'd like to make uh, comments, I, I would like to, to, to hear. Thanks very much. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, thanks for staying the time. <laughs> um, it seems to me you're kind of bypassing the really tricky question here, which is, I think, this, the notion that the, the experience of presence in the VR environment, that that will lead to um, dizziness, nausea, whatever, I think that's very intuitive, I think no one would really challenge that. And I think when we were talking about the individual differences at the very beginning, it seems that these authors, I haven't read any of these papers, but the authors are implying that basically that would lead to these individual differences, right? So if you experience presence in the VR environment, then you're more likely to have these kind of negative consequences. If you don't have presence, you're probably not going to have these effects, right? But I think the kind of the deeper question is not the link between presence and the experience of nausea, dizziness, and so on, but how is it 
that um, being in the VR environment triggers the experience of presence. Right? Like that seems to be like the deeper kind of tricky question. And I think most people would probably view that place this within the context of like a predictive coding model, looking at like expectations, like our understanding of the statistics, our environment. Everyone that's been on a roller coaster has a basic understanding about how roller coasters work, what you're going to experience, since you have all these top-down effects regarding prediction, expectation, and so on, and those then trigger this type of experience. But the problem is that the prediction, what is the connection between the prediction and the motor and, and document system? The motor system? Yes. Sorry? Yes. Well, so uh, I have a prediction that I will disappear, I will die in the fall of the, right? So this is an abstract uh, pattern in my mind. So what is the force that uh, makes me uh, behave uh, as if I'm almost, I, I will die in a few seconds? I think the, that the, the force is the emotion or, or the feeling that is, uh, say... W sure, yeah, I mean, so knowing, if I go on a VR roller coaster and I have a strong experience of that, based on my experience of roller coasters in the past where I've been afraid and I've had these physiological responses, it triggers that and it triggers these feelings that you're talking about, right? And those that have downstream kind of cascading effects, right? Yes, but you are suggesting a, a, another step in the process. So we have this prediction. Well, what I was saying is I think that that step is kind of unexplained here. Yes, I, I jumped this part, but okay. I think it's important. So we have the cognitive process and the prediction that something bad will happen. So we have the feeling, and then we have the behavior and somatic. Because, of the, 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 for instance, the change in skin conductance, it's... Uh, I think that the prediction alone will not cause the, the change in skin conduct. You need to f to have the feeling of dizziness, and then you have a change in skin conduct. Well, first of all, you can have skin conductance effects in the absence of experience, just for starters. So oh, yeah. But we'll, 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 we'll push that to the side for the moment. But, yeah, I mean, but we know there's all sorts of top-down effects. You know, there's all sorts of hallucination paradigms where if somebody comes to expect to see a stimulus, this will trigger a, a neurophysiological response as well as a conscious experience, a false percept, like a hallucination, right? Yeah, but my point is so that... So this could be very much, and those, you know, those, this could be very easily linked up with those types of effects, right? But then my, my point is that uh, only in systems able of feeling that the prediction will cause the, the, the physiological and behavioral effect. Well, I know, but the tricky part is that a lot of researchers believe that the physiological response actually precedes the conscious experience. Well, no, yeah, but right, and you might be challenging that, and that's fine. Alternatively, they might be coincident with one another. Yeah, right. Coincident. But again, I, I'm just kind of struggling to see like what is this? What does this kind of tell us above and beyond an intuitive account? of kind of VR triggering presence and then this triggering dizziness and physiological responses. You know what I mean? What does this get us above and beyond something like that when the deeper question is perhaps the link between VR triggering the experience of presence through a whole host of kind of top-down mechanisms? Well, my intention was to argue that the top-down process requires feeling, the change of feeling as a necessary step to have the somatic and behavioral effect. But of course so there are all the, uh, sorry, there are uh, all the physiological changes in the brain that occur at the same time of the feeling because they are the, the uh, for change in blood flow, they are, uh, they are not uh, dissociated of the emotional uh, state or affective state of the brain, right? The, the, what the final effect I'm, I talk about is the uh, somatic and behavioral. The, they are controlled by the brain, what, by the motor system and the system. And what, what is the part of the brain that uh, controls the, 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 that gives motivation to the motor and endocrine systems to have that type of effect? This, I, I'm arguing that this is 
responsibility of the affective system. But the affective system, of course, receives a output from the cognitive system. So you have a sequence of a st stimulation, uh, visual auditory stimulation, cognition, prediction, before the feeling. So when there is a prediction, it's, the feeling is triggered. The feeling corresponds to the change in body flow, blood flow, and ex excitation. Then this is the driving force for the somatic and behavioral change. Uh, uh, my point is that the, the, the consequences, the, the changes in som somatic and behavioral uh, manifestations depend on, on the dizziness feeling uh, uh, happening. It's not only the, the prediction. Yeah, so I think that's just the fine, that's the kind of the main thing. You're just arguing that the feeling perceives these physiological responses, right? And that's a testable prediction. And I would, you know, some people would contest that. They might say there's evidence against that. But um, I think in the interest of time, um, maybe we'll call it short, but uh, um, thanks for this though. Very, very interesting to hear about this work. Well, thank yeah. you very yeah. much. And thank you for attention and participation. And again, Alfredo's gonna be around for the next uh, five months or so. So definitely, um, he's a very friendly guy, as you can see. So, <laughs> you know. Say hello and have a chat with him, and uh, I'm sure we'll we'll hear more about your work also in the coming months, maybe in other presentations. So, yeah, thank you very Great. much. Cool. Thanks a lot. <laughs>